Welcome to Presque Isle State Park, a 3,200-acre sandy peninsula that arches into Lake Erie. I'm Jessica Stutzman, and welcome back to the Mill Creek Government Channel. I'll be guiding your tour of our community's treasured park today. Joining us are three very special guests from the PA, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, Environmental Education Specialists Brian Gula, John Laskos, and Ray Bierbauer. Folks, as I promised you, I have history buff Brian Gula here with us today, and he is going to talk about a lot of things. And so if you like history, this is going to be the segment for you. Um, Brian, I want to dive right in because we have so many cool things on the table here with us. And why don't we just start with the natural history of Presque Isle before man came to it? <laughs> sure. Um, you know, here at Presque Isle, uh, we do a lot of history programming. Uh, and we'll be doing a lot of programming throughout the winter months. Um, I do a lot of lecture uh, programs and talks at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center um, in Room 112, but different locations throughout the park as well. Uh, so definitely look for those um, as, as the winter goes on. Uh, there'll be a lot of opportunities to learn some really cool history about the peninsula. And so uh, that's always been very fascinating to me. Um, as I've had the opportunity to work here and learn about the history, and I just want to share it with everybody else. So um, I do a lot of topics uh, going all the way to the natural history, um, the formation of Presque Isle, the, the Erie area, um, all the way into uh, the development of the park and a lot of the cultural history that we have here, which is very strong here in Erie, Pennsylvania. So. Um, what you have in front of you is we have a few really cool uh, nat natural history relics. Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks, when you kind of think of you know, our, our area and, and how it was developed um, as the glaciers receded away from this area, creating Lake Erie and everything that we have today, um, you know, that was a period of time um, that that happened over. So there's a lot of information when we find artifacts or we find fossils or, you know, these all tell us a story uh, of our past. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here in the Erie area, uh, like, for example, this piece that you have in front of you, uh, this is something that just fascinates me when I first learned about it. Um, that is, you're holding a mastodon tooth. Mm -hmm. um, that was found in Frontier Park, um, you know, which is just right across the bay from us. and. Uh, it, it tells us that we had a lot of these ice age prehistoric animals that were in this area um, that could have been left over from the glaciers as the glaciers receded. Um, but uh, what you're holding in your hand is uh, is roughly 16 to 25,000 years old. That's uh, so <laughs> incredible. I absolutely love this. I feel so privileged that I'm even able to touch this right now. And uh, a mastodon is comparable to an elephant. Yes. Um, and. And I was just wondering what the difference is between um, a mastodon and a woolly mammoth. Well, uh, the mastodon, and, and again, a couple years ago, uh, there was a woolly mammoth molar discovered on Presque Isle. Um, so the main difference is the woolly mammoth molars are flat, and you can see the teeth are very rigid on a mastodon. Mm -hmm. So we can learn um, about our wildlife and a lot about our environment by teeth. Mm -hmm. um, teeth are designed for, you know, different things, eating different things, different environments. And so the mastodon was more of what we call a wood elephant, uh, heavy brows, kind of like deer today. Mm -hmm. um, browsing on, it would have been, you know, heavier, woodier uh, material, and those teeth were for grinding up that, that fibrous material mm -hmm. and, um, and, and processing that. So, and the woolly mammoth molars, they're flat on top. So they're more of like a wetland grazer. So they called them the marsh elephant. Mm -hmm. So the wood elephant and the marsh elephant. Okay, and we said that this tooth here is broken. How much bigger would it have been if we found it intact? So if, if I were to add my fist to that, um, that would be about the full length of the one molar, and it would uh, weigh approximately about two and a half pounds. Okay, wow, that is absolutely <laughs> incredible. Let's move on, and what else do we have here on the table? So this um, is an elk antler. Mm -hmm. And again, this was actually found on Presque Isle um, during a storm. Uh, it rode a section of the beach, the bank, and it fell out of the bank. And again, it tells us a unique story. Um, as we look at this, uh, there's some age to it. Um, this would have been part of the skull plate, and we know that bones are white, you know. 
And so as they sit in the environment, they start beginning that fossilization mm -hmm. process. So when we get this analyzed and take a look at, this is an elk antler, mm -hmm. but it's 9,000 years old. Wow, <laughs> oh my gosh. So again, this is a, a, a little sneak peek into, into our past yes. that we have these ice age animals mm -hmm. living right here in Erie, Pennsylvania. And who found this? Uh, this was found by a visitor uh, and then it was brought to our attention and we were super excited when we saw it yeah. and, and uh, we took it to Mercyhurst uh, University, um, uh, Scott McKenzie to take a look at it and uh, yeah, after uh, some analysis, you know, 9,000 year old elk antler. Wonderful, and so if you're a history uh, uh, fanatic like I am, you're going to uh, look into the banks um, of the uh, sand dunes and, and look for things like these, because hopefully you'll find something. Yeah, and you never know, and, and I always like to tell folks too, anytime you find a really cool artifact on Presque Isle, you know, uh, you can notify me, you can call the, the main park number, or uh, stop in at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center. Um, we have a second floor exhibit area, so we showcase a lot of these great uh, artifacts so that everybody um, locally and visiting from, from wherever they want to visit from um, can enjoy these wonderful artifacts. Wonderful, well thank you Brian for sharing these. And what's this last item on the table here? So that's gonna be a little more um, modern, a little more cultural, okay. but it's still, um, this is something that's going to date into around the mid-1800s or so. Mm -hmm. um, this would be kind of your standard whiskey jug, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, so a lot of the old ships, you know, um, Lake Erie was, was, was very important for early cargo, uh, early travel. Um, lots, of, lots of mariners, mm -hmm. a lot of mariner history on Lake Erie. And so every now and then with the storms, you never know what you're going to find. Yeah. Um, and this is just kind of one of those artifacts that... Um, kind of give us a little bit of representation of what life was like on board a ship, uh, maybe in the mid 1800s. Wonderful. Okay, and so do you want to talk a little bit about the map history of Presque Isle? And there is a stone we pass uh, driving by. Um, again, I probably passed it a thousand times in my lifetime and never realized what it was. And um, can you touch on that briefly for us? Yeah, so, um, you know, Presque Isle, because of Lake Erie, it's always been moving, it's always been changing. And um, this is an early map of the peninsula. Uh, this is what the peninsula would have looked like about during the time of Oliver Hazard Perry, so mm -hmm. about 1813. And it looks much different uh, from what we see today. And so, as, as the peninsula kind of goes through time and uh, becomes developed and becomes a state park in 1921, uh, one of the first uh, real focuses was to build a road, mm -hmm. you know, to get access for the public out onto the peninsula. So um, one of the early uh, maps, this is a map of the peninsula in 1901. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool when we see this, this is, this is pre-road, so there's no road yet onto the peninsula. And the area that we're sitting in having our talk today is right in here. Um, in those days, this was called chimney ponds. And today, this is what waterworks. And if you can see on this dotted line, this is the, pre the map that was proposed to build the water line um, through the peninsula out into Lake Erie to provide water for the city of Erie. And so, as time goes on in development, and this was one of the very first areas to become developed, mm -hmm. and it was known as Waterworks Park. Okay. So the first road that was constructed from the gates here to the Waterworks Park, it was the first opportunity for visitors to drive their mm -hmm. uh, automobiles onto the peninsula and enjoy all the wonderful things that Presque Isle has. Mm -hmm. And so the rock that we uh, took a look at, um, because it was so popular, uh, they knew right away that they needed to extend that road and take folks out beyond the Waterworks Park area and showcase the extended beaches and the interior, all the walking trails, the beautiful lagoon, and showcase all the wonderful ecosystems that we have on the peninsula. So uh, that rock was really dedicated to all the folks that were um, instrumental and getting the funds and doing the construction and the work on extending that road, providing access to everyone who came to the peninsula. I'm so glad they did. I can't imagine, 
I can't imagine Presque Isle without be able, being able to drive around the entire peninsula. And um, there was a, a group of de dedicated folks on that rock. And you said um, that they also helped uh, uh, with these pavilions and making um, access to these pavilions possible. And so there's a little dedication yeah, behind yeah. me as well. Do you want to share what that is? So th these these three uh, shelters, we call them today on our, on our map, um, uh, these were early cabins. Uh, th this, these were the first structures that were built uh, here in the waterworks area. Um, this was actually owned by the Erie, Erie Waterworks Authority up until about 1957. Um, but this was, uh, these three cabins were the first, and you can see up there, 1935 is when they constructed these. So these were, you know, now people had a place to go. They could have, uh, you know, family gatherings, fireplace picnics, and enjoy uh, you know, the, the very first uh, bathhouse was built right here in Waterworks area. Mm -hmm. So now you have guarded swimming. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is where a lot of that early recreation began. Mm -hmm. And Brian, I want to hear more about this, and I know our viewers do too. So where can our viewers um, attend your lectures and your talks, and, and when are they going to happen? So um, throughout, uh, throughout the wintertime, uh, mostly starting in November and December, January, all the way through until March, uh, We'll have uh, several history talks, uh, maybe two to three history talks a month, mm -hmm. um, which you can find uh, on our website. Um, also, if you stop at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center, uh, we put out a monthly program flyer mm -hmm. every month. And uh, so make sure you look for those opportunities and uh, join me on a history talk. Wonderful. Brian, thank you so much for bringing, again, these very special fossils and for sharing a little bit of Presque Isle history with us today. You're welcome. We are now outside the waterworks area and I'm here with Ray Bierbauer and we are going to talk about a lot of fun winter programming and activities. So Ray, let's jump right into what do we have going on this winter because I'm normally an indoor girl and I need to get outside a little bit more. Well here it's all weather dependent what we have going on so hopefully if we get the weather conditions properly we are starting our hikes up so we'll be doing those evening night hikes and stuff and day hikes. Uh, all through the fall and winter time, uh, whether we have snow or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if the opportunity presents itself with a l large amount of snow, we'll get snowshoes out. And this is something that, depending on where we are in the park and stuff, we can provide some snowshoes, but there's also our concessionaire here on the park that as long as there's uh, six inches of snow on the ground, you can rent them when they're, during their open hours here and hike any of the trails or anywhere at Presque Isle that you would like to. So unguided by yourself or with your family. So it's a great opportunity to get out and with snowshoes on it is a workout so yes. and, and, uh, it can make it easier you're not sinking as deep in the snow on the trails then mm -hmm. uh, but you're going to feel it the next day in your legs if it's not something you do every day dragging these through so. and then are the snowshoes um, good for adults only or are there child size snowshoes there's a variety of sizes so you fit the shoe depending on your activity and your size so if you're Small, you're going to get a much shorter shoe mm -hmm. uh, to keep you up, but if you're going to be running in the snow, you don't want a real big shoe mm -hmm. then. You want a smaller sport type shoe. So, mm -hmm. depending on the activity, but again, they're, they fit by size. So, the, um, somebody like around 200 pounds is going to wear about a 36 inch shoe. So, mm -hmm. they can get pretty big, but uh, it's going to definitely make it easier going through that heavy, wet snow at times on the trails. And during your hikes, are you mainly covering uh, an instructional lesson on how to use the snowshoes, or are you talking maybe about some of the park features and ecological systems? Everything. So when we meet up, we go through a little bit of that, the parts of the snowshoe, fitting them and everything so people can get them on, and the different styles, and then we go for a hike, and anything we see along the way we talk about. Some of our hikes will have a theme, other time it's just naturalist choice, well, you know, whatever we find along the way. Uh, we'll talk about and when we have folks out uh, we plan certain talking points but as we go along mm -hmm. something always shows up or somebody asks a great question and we always address that too. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay and so your next yeah. program tell me about this little guy. Okay so this is a little Dutch oven this is a small like single serving type one here mm -hmm. but we offer a lot of outdoor cooking programs that have become very popular with people. Our biggest hit was our Valentine's Day one I mm -hmm. think uh, so we had some couples come in and we cooked a meal over the fire for them so we do those at many of our pavilions here, and uh, we serve them 
uh, example of different foods and stuff. We may co cook a full meal or maybe just an example of a, mm -hmm. a soup or a chili and stuff like that mm -hmm. and let people try it as we do. So um, we demonstrate it as we're doing it. So and a lot of times it's a very interactive program with the people watching us do some of the cooking and everything. And so how does uh, cooking in these containers differ than regular cooking? So here you're using a fire with mm -hmm. hot coals. So you're controlling your heat. It's not like your oven where you turn it on and you set it at 350. You got to control all that by how many hot coals you have on or off of your cast iron, whether it's underneath mm -hmm. it and on top. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're controlling your heat that way. So it's a lot of monitoring throughout the whole process. It can take a little bit longer, but once you get kind of used to it, uh, you want to have good coals, though. that's the key. Mm -hmm. So having a, a good hot fire going the whole time to provide those hot coals really makes a difference. And you said that you go camping with these, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, you can carry like something like this size. Again, it's heavy, so mm -hmm. it's not, you know, if you're going real far, you're probably not going to want to, but this would be something that you could kind of backpack with mm -hmm. if you want. Or if you're car camping, you know, you can get the bigger ones. We have 16 quart ones and stuff that are much larger to cook larger meals and stuff. Uh, for more people and stuff mm -hmm. that you can take with you. So they're really durable once you season them, they call it. So mm -hmm. you heat them up, oil them up. You do have to make sure you keep them clean because they mm -hmm. can rust. Okay. But uh, they're really great for cooking on a lot of different things in. Okay, and so they're made out of cast iron. Yes. And they last a long time? As long as you take care of them, yes, they're going to last a lifetime and then some. They're pretty durable and such. Um, and they can take the high heat. You can even use them in your ovens at home and stuff. So they're definitely usable there, not just over a campfire. Wonderful. And then the last thing I want to talk about are is the winter ice fishing. So here at Prescott, we don't monitor the ice uh, conditions anywhere here. But when we have our programs and stuff, we do keep an eye on it uh, to make sure it is safe for us and a group of folks to be out on. But ice fishing is really popular here in Erie. Hopefully the season varies, you know, uh, with temperatures and everything. Last year was kind of up and down. Um, but when we have our programs, we check the ice conditions. Usually we like to have about six inches of good ice for a group of people to be walking out on. And if you're going to go out, it's good to have some safety items. Mm -hmm. These are ice owls. So this goes around over your neck. So you kind of wear it like a scarf. Mm -hmm. And then if you do fall in, you have something that you can push this down against the ice and this spike will come out to pull yourself out of the ice. So it's something that we recommend with anybody that's ice fishing. Okay. Uh, the adults should at least have this. Young children, a life jacket's not bad. You know, mm -hmm. one, it's gonna make them float. Two, it's a little more warmth for them mm -hmm. when they're out on the ice too. Yeah. So, and then some of the basic gear and stuff, when we do our programs, we provide, this is a really basic fishing pole that is all you really need around here for some of the smaller pan fish, mm -hmm. like bluegills, pumpkin seeds, perch. Mm -hmm. You can catch all that on something like that. And then we got something that's a little bit more fancy your spinning reel that mm -hmm. this would be good for again all those other species but you can get some of your muskies and pike possibly through the ice with one of these too so but uh when we do our ice fishing programs most of them occur here at the waterworks uh, area on mm -hmm. the pond we stock it with trout so there's uh, some brown trout in there and then there's all the other uh, panfish species as mm -hmm. well drill the holes and we usually work with the sons of lake erie when we have our family ice fishing event and people just can come out and go as they please and mm -hmm. hopefully we can catch some fish with them through the through it. And it's a really neat experience so you know expand those fishing opportunities here in Erie which are so many year round there's places to go to catch stuff and just because things freeze up doesn't mean you can't catch something there's some of the best fishing out there too. absolutely and yep. is ice fishing difficult it's it can be you know uh, nothing real tricky once you drill your hole you're just sitting there kind of moving your bait up and down the hole but locating fish can be mm -hmm. difficult there's a lot of electronic devices for doing that that mm -hmm. make it a lot easier. Uh, and also, you know, go with somebody that's done it for a while. That mm -hmm. helps a lot. A seasoned vet that's going to know how to read the ice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's important to know conditions and stuff. Mm -hmm. The safest ice is actually the stuff you can see right through and mm -hmm. see the vegetation stuff. It's eerie to walk on, but mm -hmm. that's the good stuff. When we get those real cold days, we call it the black ice that you can mm -hmm. see right through. So that's okay. important to have. Wonderful. And how do our viewers sign up for all of these wonderful programs? Because they fill up quickly. Yes, yeah, our stuff fills up quick. So monitor the DCNR calendar of events. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you call the park office here you can get on our email list and receive our monthly program flyer mm -hmm. that has everything going on every month at, at the park and all, all the ways to register and such too. Wonderful. Ray is there anything you want to share with our viewers again about all three of your programs um, that they might not already know? Uh, they're 
great to take advantage of any of them at any time because everyone's a little bit different. You may have gone snowshoeing before, but we try to go different locations. It's a different experience every time. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with like the cooking. So we do different foods and such. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do offer a different experience every time you do it. So it's just because you've done it, we might tweak it a little bit and mm -hmm. add something new to it as well. So, Wonderful. So it's good. Wonderful. So families are always welcome to come back a second time yep. and to check out your website for more information. Yep. Ray, thank you so much thank for joining you. us here today. Thank you. I'm here with John Laskos and we are here on the floating fishing platform at the East Waterworks Pond. And what we're going to talk about today is some STEM education for children and families, Correct. right? Tell right. me, what does STEM stand for? It stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Mm -hmm. And we, we just recently, within the past few years, uh, developed some evening classes, like around 6 p.m. after supper, after everyone gets off of work and has had their supper, they can come to the Tom Ridge Environmental Center and learn a little bit about STEM and how it relates to modern world. Um, the classes are about an hour to an hour and a half long, and, and it's a, a wide variety, a variable. You never know what we're gonna talk about. We really don't ever publish it in advance because we never know how many people are coming. But I've had classes on anything from how to make slime, uh, using Elmer's glue, and household the dishwashing detergent mm -hmm. so everything we can yeah. find at home we'll Any, learn at your class right? and take back with us right uh, I also teach the children or have taught in the past about magnetics mm -hmm. uh, and using neat experiments using iron filings and horseshoe magnets uh, the kids get really involved and uh, they learning about how things work using everyday common household things that you could find around the house and it also gives parents a, a, a lot of input and good ideas, especially if they're homeschooled. Mm -hmm. So they can come to these classes and have it count towards homeschool progress because it's actual science uh, being taught. That's wonderful. I never even thought about that as an option. And how fun is it to teach these classes? Oh, it's a lot of fun. Um, it, just to get a lot of kids into the classroom and they're all excited and these smiling faces and they get to get their hands dirty and mom and dad can't say anything because they're learning and a lot of fun a lot of smiles very interactive classes and everybody has a really good time and why do you think stem is so important again to our children well that's a good question um, think about nations who are really developing a lot faster than others nations like japan who is who are always ahead of the game in math and electronics mm -hmm. so teaching these courses to our children as young as an age as they can grasp mm -hmm. will only serve to help them in the long run as they further their education mm -hmm. so that's one good benefit to, to it and i love these classes again because as a mom i always want my daughter to have fun doing these experiences but i want her to take something away from them and i wanted to know again just thinking about my own family what are the age groups or, or what's the youngest and oldest that can participate in your classes we've had uh, children uh, in kindergartners come and, and as far as homeschoolers go we've had them come as old as 12th grade mm -hmm. because we can uh, who who doesn't like making slime? Uh, mm -hmm. Little kids like it, adults like it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it doesn't matter how old you are, you're, you're still gonna learn something valuable. So we, we don't turn anyone away, so long as they're with a family group. So, mm -hmm. it, and, it's, and they always have a good time. Mm -hmm. Are there a cost for these classes? These classes generally uh, uh, are no cost. Mm -hmm. No cost, it just involves your time and your willingness to commit. Uh, a lot of times we have several of these classes throughout the winter and there have been uh, several children who have made it to every single one uh-huh so uh, that's pretty cool so wonderful and what's one of your favorite classes to teach uh, obviously well anything that has to do with making slime or magnetics mm -hmm. e even something as simple as arranging skittles around a white plate mm -hmm. and filling it with water mm -hmm. and the kids watch how the colors migrate to the center of the plate make really pretty designs that 
it's uh, you know it's really cool wonderful yeah. wonderful and again before i move on to our next topic here is there anything that you want to share with our viewers about these classes that you hold don't be afraid to come and participate uh it might be a surprise to you maybe it'll be something that you've always wanted to learn more about uh, your kids will obviously absolutely enjoy it so uh, please make an effort to sign up and come out for one of our classes wonderful and the other thing i wanted to ask you about before we left today we actually caught you in action working with some monarch butterflies and again we're here mostly talking about fall and winter programming but let's talk a little bit about the importance of those monarch butterflies and what you were doing uh, today just happened, I just happened to bring my equipment just in case I got lucky while I was waiting to be interviewed and it turned out that today was a fantastic day uh, for the monarchs. They're coming in from the north on their way south and they're just all over the place today and in just a very short amount of time, maybe a half an hour, I was able to tag almost 40 monarchs. Wow. So. Is that the most you've ever tagged? In one, at, at one time, yeah. Okay. It has. So when I capture a monarch, I'm very careful to get it out of the net. And they, there's a little sticker, maybe about a quarter of an inch in diameter. Mm -hmm. It has its own unique number on it. And so when I catch the monarch, I place this little sticker on the hind wing. It doesn't affect the monarch's ability to fly or anything. It doesn't even notice it. And, and when I record that number on the sheet, I also include the zip code in the area that I was that I tagged that butterfly. So eventually that butterfly will make it to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And if it happens to be found by a migrant worker down there looking for these butterflies, uh, they will then report it to the monarchwatch.org and they will be able to see where that monarch originated from mm -hmm. and thereby be able to help trace its migration route. Mm -hmm. The migrant workers down there, uh, every time they find one of these tagged little butterflies, they're paid uh, about five US dollars per tag. Mm -hmm. And to some of those people, that's a good amount of money. Mm -hmm. So uh, that uh, th those tags are paid for uh, out of the money that we spend to buy the tags. Mm -hmm. That's how they pay these people to find it. And it's really a cool program. And why is it so important to know the migration patterns of monarch butterflies? Well, we know that there's a western population uh, that migrates to the south of California. There's a small Florida population that stays in Florida. And pretty much the monarchs east of the Rockies up into Canada, those are the ones that migrate down to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it's important to know where they're coming from. If we see a lot of monarchs coming from a certain area, we know something's got to be right there. If we don't see a lot of monarchs coming from a certain area, something might be wrong. Mm -hmm. There might be habitat loss. There might be, uh, might have lost a lot of milkweed, which is a big problem. Mm -hmm. The monarch only lays its eggs on milkweed. Okay. Uh, they will drink and feed off of just about any nectar producing flower, but they will only lay their eggs on monarchs mm -hmm. or on milkweed. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, and so helping figure out the migration route help us figure out those other details too. Mm -hmm. And today was just a perfect day. I just co pure coincidence happened to be a lot of monarchs. And, and I, every year I buy about a hundred tags. Mm -hmm. I've never tagged, I've never used them all. But this year, I'm going to use them all. That's so, wonderful. So that's pretty cool. It was good. a good day. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. I'm yeah. so glad we, again, caught you in action and you were able to share that with us. Um, Thank you yeah, so I'm much. I'm very happy to share. Yep. Well, our time here is just about done. And again, I want to thank you so much for your time and everything you do for the park and, and for our families here in Erie, PA. Very welcome. Thank My you. Pleasure. As Pennsylvania's only seashore, Presque Isle offers its visitors a beautiful coastline and many recreational activities for individuals and families alike. Lake Erie is unsalted, shark-free, and provides us with so much fun year-round. Come join us on the peninsula and remember to drive 25. Thank you for tuning into the Mill Creek Government Channel, and until next time, have a great day.